always a lot going on for each one of us. A lot going on in my family. And the scriptures instruct us to pray for our leaders, our country, our town, as well as our church and each other. So with that in mind, let us pray. Father God, we come in the mighty name of Jesus. We come in a troubled time, in a troubled world, and we pray for our president we pray for our congress our courts we pray for these people who are oath bound to do a honorable job we pray for each one of them father we pray for our governor our state legislature our state courts father we pray for the town of quincy its its government we pray for the schools we pray that you would send missionaries into the public schools janitors, teachers, all kinds of people, that your word would go into the world of the young people. Father, we pray for this church, our pastor, everyone involved in the mission of this church. We pray that you would continue to guide, direct in this troubled time. Father, that your word would go forth. We think of Paul in chains standing before kings, and yet he's the commanding voice. We pray for your wisdom, your boldness, uh, as well as grace. Father, we're in a time when people don't talk to each other. Uh, we pray for our country uh, that revelation would be made known of crimes that need to be brought to, to the courts and also that forgiveness would be extended across many an aisle. We pray for this in the name of Jesus. Father, we pray as the Lord Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Please take a moment or two for silent confession. Change your posture, bow or whatever you feel. Please stand with me for an assurance of grace. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And what has Christ done? Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone. A new life has begun. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Thanks be to God.
seated. All right. Um, well, I'm going to let the, the children go downstairs right after uh, announcements. We've moved announcements up in the service, and I just want to highlight a few. Actually, our children's director, um, Kara Whitaker, was going to do the announcements today and then lead uh, her uh, children downstairs and lead the other families downstairs. Unfortunately, you can pray for Tom and Kara and for uh, John, Jonathan or John T. Whitaker uh, has uh, it's a high fever and they weren't able to come today. So uh, please join me in uh, lifting them up in prayer. Um, but we are still doing the, the uh, family space downstairs for children right after uh, a few announcements here. Uh, community group will meet this Tuesday at 7.30 over Zoom. Uh, so if you uh, need any information on that, please talk to me or send me an email. There is a congregational meeting tonight. Uh, is that 7.30? 7, 7 p.m. Um, 7 p.m. tonight. That will be virtual. If you are a member, uh, please, we would appreciate if you would try to attend. And if you're not a member, you're also welcome to attend as we look at the uh, business and some decisions that are being made uh, on the broader Christ the Redeemer is part of a larger multi-congregational church, Christ the King Presbyterian, uh, that, it, that is throughout greater Boston. Um, Next weekend, uh, October 24th is Saturday at 2 p.m., we're going to have the first discovery course. So uh, this is the first step in becoming an official member of Christ the Redeemer. If you have questions about that, uh, please see me afterwards. The course will just kind of go over our vision. Uh, it'll be interactive. If you want to watch the recording or join on Zoom, we can work that out. Um, but uh, this will just be the first step. There'll be a kind of a follow-up conversation. But if you want more information on that, uh, please talk to me afterwards or, again, send me an email. Um, this is a new announcement on Halloween, which is on a Saturday this year, October 31st. We are going to have kind of an outreach on the front sidewalk here on uh, Rawson Road. 
Anybody who wants to could come. We'll, uh, we'll have masks on, but we'll be able to, to put candy out so that kids that are passing by can, can grab some candy. And we'll also have information about the church, information about Christianity for anybody who wants to stop and talk or stop and take something. So that is going to be on uh, Saturday, October 31st from 3 to 5 uh, p.m., I believe. And look for more information on that that uh, Kara will send out. That's all the announcements that I have. Um, before the children go downstairs, uh, it's my honor to be able to pray for them uh, before they dismiss. So uh, let's pray. Lord, we are grateful for um, your children. Uh, Lord, uh, as we will see in this passage, Lord, they are not primarily our children. They are yours, and uh, we commit them to you. Uh, we pray that uh, even now, Lord, uh, in the, the teaching of your word, in the way that the adults interact with them, we pray that they would know and that they would experience and feel something of uh, the love of God for them that is uh, beyond comprehension. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, if you would, now the rest of the congregation, as those parents take their children downstairs, please stand for our next song. Forsaken For by myself 
Please remain standing for the reading today, which is 1 Samuel chapter 9, verses 15 through 17. And then after, we're going to read chapter 10, verses 1 through something, 27. 1 Samuel chapter 9. Now the day before Saul came, the Lord had revealed to Samuel, Tomorrow about this time I will send to you a man from the land of Benjamin, and you shall anoint him to be prince over my people Israel. He shall save my people from the hands of the Philistines, for I have seen my people because their cry has come to me. When Samuel saw Saul, the Lord told him, here is the man of whom I speak to you. He it is who shall restrain my people. Then Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it on his head and kissed him and said, Has not the Lord anointed you to be prince over the people Israel? And you shall reign over the people of the Lord, and you will save them from the hand of their surrounding enemies. And this shall be the sign to you that the Lord has anointed you to be prince over his heritage. When you depart from me today, you will meet two men by Rachel's tomb in the territory of Benjamin at Zelzah. And they will say to you, the donkeys that you went to seek are found. And now your father has ceased to care about the donkeys and is anxious about you, saying, What shall I do about my son? Then you shall go on from there farther and come to the oak at Tabor. Three men carrying, three men going up to God at Bethel will meet you there, one carrying three young goats, another carrying three loaves of bread, and another carrying a skin of wine. And they will greet you and give you two loaves of bread, which you shall accept from their hand. After that, you shall come to Gibeath Olim, where there is a garrison of the Philistines. And there, as soon as you come to the city, you will meet a group of prophets coming down from the high place with harp, tambourine, flute, and lyre before them, prophesying. Then the Spirit of the Lord will rush upon you, and you will prophesy with them and be turned into another man. Now when these signs meet you, do what your hand finds to do, for God is with you. Then go down before me to Gilgal, and behold, I am coming down to you to offer burnt offerings and to sacrifice peace offerings. Seven days you shall wait until I come to you and show you what you shall do. When he turned his back to leave Samuel, God gave him another heart, and all these signs came to pass that day. When they came to Gibeah, 
behold, a group of prophets met him, and the Spirit of God rushed upon him, and he prophesied among them. And when all who knew him previously saw how he prophesied with the other prophets, the people said to one another, What has come over the son of Kish? Is Saul among the prophets? And a man of the place answered, And who is their father? Therefore it became a proverb, Is Saul also among the prophets? When he had finished prophesying, he had come to the high place. Saul's uncle said to him and to his servant, Where did you go? And he said, To seek the donkeys. And when we saw they were not to be found, we went to Samuel. And Saul's uncle said, Please tell me what Samuel said to you. And Saul said to his uncle, He told us plainly that the donkeys had been found. But about the matter of the kingdom, of which Samuel had spoken, he did not tell him anything. Now Samuel called the people together to the Lord at Mizpah, and he said to the people of Israel, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I brought up Israel out of Egypt, and I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians, and from the hand of all the kingdoms that were oppressing you. But today you have rejected your God, who saves you from all your calamities and your distresses, and you have said to him, Set a king over us. Now therefore present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your thousands. And then Samuel brought all the tribes of Israel near, and the tribe of Benjamin was taken by Lot. He brought the tribe of Benjamin near his, nearby his clans, and the clan of the Matratites was taken by Lot. And Saul the son of Kish was taken by Lot. But when they sought him, he could not be found. So they inquired again of the Lord, is there a man still to come? And the Lord said, Behold, he has hidden himself among the baggage. Then they ran and took him from there. And when he stood among the people, he was taller than any of the people from his shoulders upward. And Samuel said to all the people, Do you see him whom the Lord has chosen? There is none like him among all the people. And all the people shouted, Long live the king. Then Samuel told the people the rights and duties of the kingship, and he wrote them in a book and laid it before the Lord. Then Samuel sent all the people away, each one to his home. Saul also went to his home at Gilbeah, and with him went men of valor whose hearts God had touched. But some worthless fellows said, How can this man save us? And they despised him and brought him no present, but he held his peace. This is the word of the Lord. Be seated. All right, good afternoon. Uh, if you weren't here at the beginning, my name is Matt, and I'm the pastor of Christ the Redeemer Quincy. Uh, I seem to remember last time Alex read getting a, a really long passage, so thank you for being our long passage reader, Alex. Um, and, uh, and I just want to say, um, Thankful for, for Matt and Julie and Ed Neer leading us in, and Asaph leading us in worship. Uh, that song, I don't usually talk about our songs, but that song's actually been on repeat on my Spotify this week, driving around, uh, Yet Not I, But Christ. It's a little bit of a convoluted title, but uh, really beautiful. And, uh, and so I would encourage you to look that up if you enjoyed that song, and uh, it's so, so calming. Um, so before we uh, dig into this, uh, this long passage, would you join me in prayer? Father, um, to this I hold, my shepherd will defend me. Uh, Jesus now and forever is our plea. Uh, it is uh, in his name that we come, uh, that we know that uh, through him we will reign. And uh, I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit uh, would reign in our hearts now, uh, that we would uh, be attentive to your word, that we would be open to what it has to say to us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We live in a country in which the historical narrative is decidedly anti-king. The very founding of our country is the rejection of a king. And yet, in spite of this, how fascinated we are with the same royalty that we rejected. Uh, whether it's an obsession with uh, royal weddings, which seems to happen every few years, 
uh, or the fact that one of the most popular uh, Netflix shows is The Crown. There's this fascination with all things royal. Consider also how many of our uh, lasting legends follow this basic narrative that once there was a good king reigning, and under this good king, the land flourished. Uh, there was peace and justice. But then something happened. The king is betrayed or is forced to leave. Some evil overtakes the kingdom, oppresses its people, and they long for the return of the king. We think of the story of King Arthur. Legend has it that on his grave is written, the once and future king. The idea that he would return again to reinstate peace and flourishing. Camelot. We think uh, in the 20th century of the Lord of the Rings, or at least I do, uh, in which the true king, of whom it was said the hands of the king would bring healing to the land, the true king is hidden amongst the rangers in the north. We think of, and I, I mentioned uh, last week, the Lion King. The pride land is flourishing. Stories and legends, I'm sure there's plenty more, are popular and they capture our imaginations in spite of the fact that the actual historical record of kings is uh, really pretty awful. The history of kings is one, for the most part, characterized by tyranny, oppression, injustice. This kingship was described in the passage that we looked at last week in the middle of 1 Samuel 8, a king who would take and take and not give. Sure, there are or exceptions to this, but how often in the Bible or in history do we get uh, multiple successive generations of good, just rulers? Even two or three generations. Not very often. And yet, in democrat democratic countries like the U.S., we still find this deep human impulse to crown something or someone. How often people are duped by uh, some dynamic, charismatic figure, uh, be it political or uh, religious, a cult leader, prosperity gospel preacher. Uh, our celebrities, professional athletes are often made into kings or queens. Uh, one of LeBron James, the, uh, who just won the, the uh, NBA championship, one of his nicknames after all is King James. Well, we looked at last week, James K.A. Smith says, fundamental to being human is that we are the kind of creatures who give ourselves over to someone or something. We devote ourselves to something, whether we're conscious of it or not. And Tim Keller suggests that the reason that the stories of the good king uh, resonate so deeply with us is because we have this memory trace. There's something deep within us that knows that there is a true king, who we were made to honor and serve, and there's a longing for his return. The narrative of 1 Samuel, going back into the book of Judges, has been moving towards the moment we find here in this passage, where God's people will anoint and proclaim a king. The people in the previous passage had asked for the wrong king, arising from wrong motives. They demanded a king like the nations. But we see here, that the Lord will not allow them, will not allow the people to define what his king will look like. He graciously gives them not what they ask for, but what they need. And so we're going to look today uh, at just two points. First, God's king, God's way, God's word. And second, the king conquers, the king lives, the king reigns. So first, God's king, God's way, God's word. When we first meet young Saul in chapter 9, uh, far from what we'd expect of the future king, he's out searching for donkeys. Uh, but we see here in verses 15 through 17, the Lord had something else in mind for Saul. He tells Samuel he's sending him the man who uh, will be anointed prince over his people. He will save his people from the Philistines and restrain his people. Did you catch that? Three times in two verses, the Lord uses the phrase, my people. The people may have a king, 
But if, it's, if he's going to be king over God's people, he will be God's king who will lead in God's way, following God's word. It's God who's raised up Saul, not only to rule, but we see here to restrain the people. Saul means asked of the Lord. The Lord will uh, use him as a gracious answer to the people's prayers, to the people's troubles with the Philistines. Similar to when uh, in the book of Exodus, God's people enslaved in Egypt cried out to the Lord and their groanings reached his ears. And we see throughout the scriptures that our suffering does not escape God's notice. He sees, he hears, he knows, and he acts. But Saul knows nothing yet of what role he is to play. So imagine being Saul. Uh, You're out looking for some donkeys, and your friend suggests going to see the prophet. So you ask a man where to find the prophet, only to discover that that man is the prophet, Samuel. And not only does he know where your donkeys are, he knows exactly who you are. And he has a message for you. It's like if you were lost and stopped to ask someone for directions, and they uh, told you that they had a message that you were to be the king or queen of America. Of course, you would think that they were insane because America obviously doesn't have a king or a queen. But that's my point. Israel, up to this point, had never had a king. So Samuel takes Saul to a feast where he's given the seat of honor. And then at the beginning of chapter 10, Samuel anoints his head with oil, kisses him, declares that he will reign over God's people and deliver them from the hands of the Philistines. Well, this is a lot to take in. And so Samuel then gives Saul uh, several signs, tells him uh, all of what is about to to happen. Uh, And these are not vague predictions like a a fortune teller. He's very specific. He says, you'll go here and meet two men. They'll have three goats, uh, three loaves of bread, a, a skin of wine. Then you'll meet this group of prophets. You'll join them in prophesying, even though you never have before. And there's no indication that Saul ever will again. But the point of the signs is at the end of verse 9, they all come to pass. And so Saul is being shown that his kingship is dependent on God's word. He's being taught to trust God's word. There's really no question of who's in charge here. It's not Saul. Samuel is the one who hears the word of the Lord and tells it to Saul, who anoints and instructs him. Saul defers to Samuel, The prophet, the one who hears and speaks God's word, at this point still looms larger than the king. And we might take from that that God's king is to be under God's word. Saul becomes king through the word of God, and he must rule as king according to it. Israel's demand for a king was an idolatrous rejection of the Lord who was their king. But if the Lord was going to allow his people a king, it would be God's king. God's way, ruling according to his word. And if not, the king will be removed for another who will follow God's word, a man after God's own heart. God's people demanded a king like the nations, but the Lord graciously protects them from the oppression that is so common among kings. Part of why democracy has replaced uh, monarchy, at least across the Western world, Uh, is is because democracy makes sense, because it recognizes that none of us are really fit to rule. We're all too sinful. But while democracy is a good thing, uh, as Tim Keller has put it, democracy is medicine, not food. It's a response to a problem, but not what we were made for. The reason the stories of the good and true king resonate so deeply is because we were made to honor and to serve the true king. In the beginning, when God created the world under his rule, the whole creation flourished. There was peace, harmony, wholeness, with all creation honoring and serving its creator, the true and perfect king. But of course, it didn't last. When the people demand a king to rule over them, as they did in the previous chapter, it's an echo of what happened in the garden where humanity rejected the Lord as king, preferring the tragic lie that we are our own authority, that we are on the throne. And this, uh, what we might call cosmic authority problem, 
this desire to establish our own kingdoms apart from God, to be our own, has been passed down. In various ways, we find this desire for self-rule in each and every human heart. Even our son, uh, Liam, uh, smiley, as good and kind as he may appear to um, people that aren't his parents, uh, went through a phase recently in which his favorite disobedient reply was, no, I don't want to do anything I don't want to do. Well, how often by our actions do we say that to God? We all have this uh, cosmic authority problem. And that's a phrase that I'm actually borrowing from uh, the philosopher Thomas Nagel, uh, who once wrote, uh, this is interesting, I want atheism to be true and am made uneasy by the fact that some of the most intelligent and well-informed people I know are religious believers. It isn't just that I don't believe in God and naturally hope that I'm right in my belief. It's that I hope there is no God. I don't want there to be a God. I don't want the universe to be like that. My guess is that this cosmic authority problem is not a rare condition. Well, interesting that Thomas Nagel, a philosophy professor at NYU, a few years later kind of rocked the philosophy world by saying that he had come to believe in God. Uh, But it began with, I think, coming to terms with this cosmic authority problem, recognizing that belief or unbelief is usually not primarily intellectual, but stems from not wanting an authority greater than oneself, because we want to do what we want to do. Uh, Eddie Vedder of uh, the band Pearl Jam, my favorite band in high school, uh, once wrote a song, I know I was born and I know that I'll die. The in-between is mine. I am mine. And uh, I am my own, George MacDonald wrote years earlier than that, is the central conviction of hell. I am my own not only is the principle of all hell, but also the conviction that leads to hell on earth. Because if everyone is living only for themselves, not recognizing a greater king, a greater authority, it creates a hell, a hell in society, a hell in our relationships. And so the deepest problems of this world can't be fixed by any human king, nor by any politician or political party. The problems of this world run much deeper than that. They run down into every human heart where we find pride, and selfishness, and sin. And it's because of this, it's because no one is fit to rule God's people, that at the outset of his kingship, we see in verse 9, God gave Saul another heart. The Spirit of God rushed upon him. Now this is really interesting. Um, I'm happy to talk more about this later, but it's tempting to read this through the lens of the New Testament and conclude, oh, what's happening here is Saul becomes a Christian. He's born again. But what's more likely, given uh, the trajectory of Saul and uh, given that we see in the book of Judges that the Spirit of God often rushes upon uh, some of the judges for them to accomplish God's purposes of delivering the people, Uh, what's more likely is that that's the case here, that the Lord gives Saul a new heart, makes him a new man, that he might follow the way of the Lord at least at the outset of his kingship. Saul is king, but like all of us, He needs God's sovereign intervention. Though the Lord has been rejected as king, he will graciously ensure that his people are ruled by his king, ruling his way in accord with his word. That's the first point. Let's look now at uh, the second point. The king conquers, the king lives, and the king reigns. Well, Saul returns home after uh, an an eventful couple of days. (laughs) Uh, And his uncle, verse 14, uh, asks him where he's been. Now, it's surprising what Saul leaves out. He says that he went to seek the donkeys. When they couldn't find them, they went to see Samuel. But when his uncle asked him what Samuel said, uh, Saul simply says, verse 16, he told us the donkeys were found. He says nothing about the matter of the kingdom, about being anointed king. This is obviously a big deal. So why does he hide this? Well, he appears to be uh, extremely reluctant, apprehensive about being king. We see this again in the final part of chapter 10. Saul calls all of Israel together to cast lots to see who the new king will be, uh, or the, the, the king will be, the first king. 
uh, which is casting lots is a way for God to reveal his will through a, a process that's like, probably like drawing straws. Um, when they cast lots and the lot falls on Saul, he's hiding among the baggage. This may be an ominous sign of what's to come, that before his reign even begins, Saul is lost. He's hiding. And the people need the Lord's help to find him, to find their king. No, we may be tempted to read this as uh, just Saul being shy or humble. It's not humble to question or challenge uh, what God has declared, what God has made plain. He's shying away from the responsibility that God had given him. He lacks confidence, not just in himself, but in God continuing to give him the strength, the words, the wisdom to rule his people. His cowardice reflects that he's not trusting the Lord with all his heart, but leaning on his own understanding, his own strength. And so we get our first glimpse here of a king who hides, which we'll see later in 1 Samuel uh, when the Philistine champion Goliath shows up taunting the people and the, and the God of Israel. Israel had demanded a king who would go out before them and fight their battles. God gave them a king who was head and shoulders taller than the rest. A warrior king they may well have chosen themselves. He was the obvious choice to go out and fight Goliath, relying on the Lord's power, but instead he hides. Because when your confidence is only in your own strength, not in the Lord's, it will always be fickle and limited. Our confidence must be in the Lord, whose power and love know no limits. Verse 23, the people run and take Saul from where he was hiding. They're ready to make him king by force. And as he stands among the people, head and shoulders above everybody else, Samuel says to the people, verse 24, Do you see him whom the Lord has chosen? There is none like him among all the people. And the people declare a phrase common then, still heard around the world today, Long live the king. The Lord, in many ways, has given the people what they've asked for. An impressive uh, warrior king, head and shoulders above the rest. But the first thing that happens when Saul uh, is king re reinforces that the king is to be subservient to God's word. Samuel, verse 25, tells the people the rights and duties of kingship. This is possibly something similar to Deuteronomy 17, which we saw last week, in which the Lord permits a king that he would choose over the people. But he says that king must not acquire many horses for himself, and he shall not acquire many wives for himself, nor shall he acquire for himself excessive silver or gold. To prevent the tyranny and oppression that so often characterizes kingship, the king must govern according to God's word. He's not king to serve himself, but he's God's king to serve the people. Everyone is sent home, but as they go, some worthless fellows ask in verse 27, how can this man save us? Now the, these worthless fellows, this is literally uh, the sons of wickedness, uh, are not just challenging Saul's authority, but the authority of the Lord who set him in place. But even if this question uh, arises from ill motives, it's a legitimate question. How can this man save us? What all humanity is looking for essentially is a savior. In his uh, last column in the New York Times uh, as he was dying of AIDS in 1993, Jeffrey Schmalz writes, uh, confesses really, uh, that he had come to believe that his salvation was getting a Democrat into the White House in 1992, uh, which did happen. But in his last column published uh, posthumously, published after his death, Schmalz confessed how naive he was and writes, I really did see him as the white knight who might save me. Part of the tragedy of not knowing the Lord as true king is that we will always look to someone or something else to save us. So we are right to ask of any worldly king, how can this man save us? And the answer is always, he can't. 
She can't. Anytime we look to a worldly savior, whether a king or president or someone you hope will come and sweep you off your feet, anytime we look to a worldly savior, we will be disappointed. Psalm 146.3, put not your trust in princes, in human beings, in whom there is no salvation. There's only one who can save, only one uh, of which it can be truly said, there is none like him among all the people. Uh, Acts 4.12, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by, much, by which we must be saved. God's anointed king, that phrase in the Old Testament, anointed king, is Mashiach, which we say Messiah, which translated into Greek is Christ. Jesus Christ is the true anointed king. God's king who reigns according to God's word. He says to his disciples uh, in John 14, 10, The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me. He is the ancient king who is from the beginning, and he is, in fact, uh, not only ruling by God's word, he is God's word, the word of God who became flesh and dwelt among us. Like Saul, at one point, the people with worldly visions of power after he's fed the 5,000, would take him by force and make him king. But he does not give in to the demands of the people because he is God's king, following God's way. And God's way means uh, being brought low for a time rather than exalting himself. God's way for Jesus is the way of the cross. As Tim Keller writes, at the climax of this king's life, he ascended not a throne, but a cross. A cross on which he would wear a crown, but not one made of gold. He would wear a crown of thorns, fashioned to mock and to torture the true king of the universe. Unlike Saul, Jesus did not hide from his Goliath, the cross of Calvary. But through it, he vanquished the greater giants of sin and death and hell. As the Westminster Shorter Catechism asks, how does Christ execute the office of a king? And the answer, he executes the office of a king by subduing us to himself and ruling and defending us in restraining and conquering all of his and our enemies. That the cross, the enemies of sin, death, and hell, the enemies that oppress all of humanity, appeared momentarily to have won. But on the third day, all of heaven shouted together, Long live the King. For in His resurrection, He conquered all of His and our enemies. And so we say, Long live the King, in whom all the stories and legends and myths find their fulfillment. He is the good and true King who reigns with wisdom and justice, compassion and glory of the increase of government and of peace, there will be no end. For he has swallowed up death and he will live and reign forever and ever. So what does it mean for us that Jesus is king? I'll close with four brief applications. First, uh, it means that the world is in the hands of the true king that it needs. As Tolkien wrote in uh, The Lord of the Rings, though omitted from the movies, the hands of the king are the hands of a healer, and so shall the rightful king be known. He's got the whole world in his hands, the hands that bring healing, because they were wounded for us. If we load our hopes on any human leader as the ultimate source of our salvation for our world, for our country, then we've misplaced our hope. It means, second, that we must take the, the true king's allies as our allies and his enemies as our enemies. In this time of increased political discord, it's so easy to see other flesh and blood humans as the ultimate enemy. But being part of Jesus' kingdom means loving our enemies. So if you're someone who hates an earthly enemy, then you've completely assimilated to the way of the world, not the way of the true king. 
Paul writes in Ephesians 6 that our ultimate battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual forces of evil. Only when we know this can we keep from demonizing and dehumanizing other human beings made in the image of God. Third, it means that uh, we do not follow the pattern of this world, but the pattern of God's king and his kingdom. In the book of Revelation, John has a vision of a throne room in heaven. And what does he see on the throne? The lamb who was slain. You see, even in his heavenly glory, there's a reminder of Jesus' suffering, of how he became human, became vulnerable. And the multitudes cry out, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. He will be praised for all eternity, not only because he's all powerful, but because he conquered by humbling himself and being willing to suffer, to suffer death, even death on a cross. And if this is uh, the king that we serve and follow, then we must look like our king. Lastly, Jesus' kingship means uh, that we must surrender to him as king. He cannot be and will not be treated as a consultant, but must be honored as king, must be worshipped as king, which means that we uh, know him and worship him as he is, not as we wish him to be. It means that we accept the authority of his word, even that which is difficult to accept. There's no one like him among the people. He alone is worthy of all honor and glory and power and praise. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, uh, even now, uh, through your word, through your spirit, we get a glimpse uh, of that heavenly throne room. Lord, would you lift our hearts up there now uh, that we might uh, cry out to you in our hearts and with our mouths uh, that you are worthy. Uh, you are worthy of, of us living our entire lives for you, you and no one else. You are worthy of all honor and blessing and glory and power uh, because you created us and you redeemed us at great cost to yourself we ask we pray these things in jesus name amen well as we uh, move into a time of uh, a celebration of the lord's supper uh, what we are essentially eating and drinking to uh, is the king uh, we are, in, in many ways, lifting up our glass to the king, to what he's done. Because we are saying uh, that we are coming together. Uh, that we, the body of Christ, belong uh, to God. Belong in fellowship with one another and with him because of what Christ has done. And so, as we uh, take, we proclaim, long live the king. Uh, if you are... Um, someone who has placed your faith in Christ, uh, whether you're a member of this church or, uh, or not, uh, if you have embraced Christ as your Savior, as your King, uh, then you are welcome to partake of this meal with us. Um, if, if that's not you, uh, we're really glad that you're here, um, but we would ask respectfully that this meal um, be for those who have placed their faith in Christ. In fact, uh, that's what God word, God's Word uh, tells us uh, that we ought to do. It tells us that uh, this meal is one of uh, fellowship for those who are believers, for those who are in Christ. Um, so uh, as we prepare to take uh, communion, we will uh, say res pray responsibly uh, the great prayer of thanksgiving that has been prayed uh, for centuries past. Please respond with the bold print. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. With joy we give thanks to you, Jesus Christ, for by your life, death, and resurrection, you have given to us true and eternal life. 
Therefore, we lift our voices with all of your people and angels and the whole of your creation to proclaim the glory of your name, saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Let us now boldly proclaim the mystery of the faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, the gifts of God for the people of God. The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. On the same night after supper, he took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread and drink the cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. In just a moment, I'm going to come around. Uh, you can take a cup that has both a, a wafer under the first seal and juice under the second. If you would, hold on to that cup until I come back up here and lead us. Uh, we'll wait to partake together as a sign of our unity in Christ. would invite you to taste and see that the Lord is good. body of Christ, take and eat. The blood of Christ shed for you, take and drink. Would you pray with me? Lord, it is uh, in you and it is because of you that we celebrate this meal. I pray that you would write these things on our heart, uh, that we might cry out to you uh, in our hearts and lift our voices up in singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And Lord, I pray that uh, that same 
uh, sense of wonder, of your uh, holiness, of your uh, grace, of your kingship would stay with us as we go out into the world to love and to serve you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you would, please stand for our closing song. by his word called us into his presence to worship him this afternoon. Now hear his word, this good word, this benediction, as he sends you out to love and to serve him this week. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, both now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. On your way out, uh, you